All right, uh, let's get straight into the continuation of our discussion, which was the world's definition of love. Now, what I wanted to do just initially in coming back was to revise some of the things we covered when we were in the Melbourne session about the world's definition of love versus God's definition of love. Does that sound all right? So the world's view of love is that love is painful. You know those songs that go, love hurts. <laughs> you know the song. And uh, God's view of love is that love is never painful. Hmm. Love is never painful. Well then, why do I feel pain when I love and somebody else doesn't love me back? Mm. Because of an emotional error. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the key thing to remember is that this, this is the world's view of love. And the world's view of love is coming from a fear-based perspective. You, we need to remember that from our previous discussion. Since it's coming from a fear-based perspective... Pain is going to be a result of living in fear at some point. So this whole idea that love is painful isn't, isn't the truth. Love is never painful is the truth. Um, is there any questions about that? Because it's just a revived vision. You can look at the material myself and Mary presented in that uh, discussion in Melbourne, which goes through the material properly. But I just want to revise this part of the material at this point. Love is demanding. How many times do we feel that? That we can demand something of someone, they should have done that for me because they, they say they love me. Does that make much sense really in the end with regard, well it does to the world, but uh, if God's view is love is never a demand. You don't see God placing demands on your life. In fact, when it comes to demands, God is silent. Dave, is it all right to not go behind me because you distract the audience and then they're all watching you do what you're doing rather than, rather than listening to the material that's important that's getting presented. Yep, sorry about that, mate. Um, so, so love is never a demand. Um, and the reason why is that uh, God herself doesn't demand anything of us. God is hopeful, so love is often hopeful that we do something or that we follow something and so forth but it, there's never a demand in it reminds me of a line have you ever watched the movie phenomenon yeah, yeah? Uh, john travolta and i forget the the woman character in it just right near the end how many of you have not watched it yeah mary keeps warning me to never tell the ending i'll just tell just a little the little bit he, he just says he just he, she comes she comes up the hill and she sees a blanket lying on the ground and she says are you expecting something and he smiles at her and he says no I'm just hoping <laughs> <laughs> so love doesn't demand or expect love does hope though right so there's a difference between those qualities um, the world's view is love is sacrifice. You know, the whole idea that I came in the first century to die for mankind's sins would never ever have made any logical sense to anyone unless the world had the view that love is sacrifice. Because the world has the view that love is sacrifice, they then see what I did as an ultimate sacrifice. But the reality is quite different to that. Love is never a sacrifice. I did not feel that I was sacrificing myself and never do I feel that I'm sacrificing myself if I'm in a condition where I love. Now that's interesting, isn't it? How many times in a day-to-day -day relationship do we feel like, oh, I've got to compromise here, I've got to compromise here, and we'll talk about compromise in a minute. Um, quite frequently. I suggest. And this fourth one is interesting that love is justice. I once had a man say to me, um, he was a psychologist, and he was telling me why I was unhappy in my relationship with my, my, my ex wife. And he said, You know, he said, it's all about justice. If you 
and her both give the same amount and receive the same amount then at the end of the day you'll be happy and while he's right with regard to human relationships and I had to admit that he was right that's not what love is because love is not justice if love was justice then if you poked my eye out what would love tell me to do poke yours back out an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth is the principle of justice but it does not engage necessarily the principle of love All right. so we can't continue to think that love is justice many of you still want justice rather than love you think about it in your relationships how many times do you want justice rather than love you want oh, I've done this for you what about what are you doing for me we want an evenness in what's being done compared to what's being done for us that is called justice and while justice can have its place it's certainly not love because love gives gifts that never have a expectation of return very very different isn't it so the other four things we discussed myself and Mary discussed uh, in a couple of hours with the group down in Melbourne one of the groups down in Melbourne does everyone get those those things like how you can see the contrast now already can you see that the world's definition of love when we see all of these things here we can see there is already the fear perception is it, you can see it coming through it can't you through these ideas the fear is underlying many of these ideas about love whereas if you look at this you can see that there is no fear in any of those concepts of love that God has they're all very very different in the in conceptually to the world's view so if I have grown up with this view it's going to be quite painful to release that view and accept this view obviously because I've grown up thinking this so if I can give you some illustrations of that example is when I love somebody who does not love me back now for most of us in the past we would have felt pain about that would we not many of us still do some of you right now are loving people who don't love you back and you feel a large degree of pain as a result but if it was love then it wouldn't be painful so that's telling me that it's not love that I'm feeling is this love is this love is this love is this love that I'm feeling we've got to ask ourselves that question I like I realized in a lot of this in the rediscovery of a lot of this um, feelings about love and the quality you could call these the qualities of love what does love truly display when I when I started investigating that in my own life I had to be very honest with myself because you can stay in a belief that love is painful if you wish you can feel over and over again how painful it is to love somebody who doesn't love you back however if you do so you will never come to accept the truth which is God's view and remember when we become at one with God we are accepting God's view on everything particularly everything regarding love so while I'm holding on to this idea that love is painful I am preventing myself from ever getting to the truth that love is never painful and I'm also not contrasting I'm not saying to myself right if God's saying love is never painful and I believe love is painful then I have a problem with my definition of love not God I have the problem and if I have the problem how am I ever going to get to this place when I want to hold on to that place to this this false view the world's view I'm never going to get there and I think it's very important for each of you to understand that with all of these things that we say the world's view is and then we're contrasting them with God's view if we don't have some kind of sense within ourselves that we want to have God's view at some point then we'll be very tempted to hold on to these views 
in our own pain. We will be creating our own pain as a result, holding on to these views. When we have God's view, the pain of love disappears. And instead, and when I say God's view, it's not God's view from the mind, but rather it is a feeling that you feel within your heart. So I can say to you, love is never painful. And you can say, all right, love is never painful. Love is never painful. I have to remember that. Love is never painful. And then when a situation happens where you love somebody and they don't love you back, you go, oh, I shouldn't be feeling pain because love is never painful. That's not what I'm asking you to do. Because that is just intellectualizing yourself over the emotion you feel, which is that love is painful because I'm feeling the pain of it right now. I'm suggesting you need to feel that pain. However, understand in that moment that it, God's, it, when you're in God's place of seeing love and feeling love, you will, will not feel that pain, that pain that you now are feeling. And it's very important for you to see the difference of that in terms of a feeling rather than an intellectual thought jumping over a feeling that you have. Don't try to falsify to yourself the feeling and use your intellect to get out of the real feeling that you have. Tim, please. Just keep your hand up, Tim. Thanks. Uh, it's not on at the moment, I don't think, is it? The press the red button and it should be a... It might pay to... Is the second one on, Tris? Can you take the second one on to Tim and... Oh, okay. oh that's on. Thanks. There we go. Um, yeah, I was just wondering... Is love um, directly relative to happiness? So, like, if you have absolutely no love in your soul, does that mean you have absolutely no happiness? Or So, like, is love the breeding place for happiness? Well, it depends what kind of happiness you're talking about. If it's the happiness from having your addictions fulfilled, then love isn't that place. But, but it is the true soul-based joy. It's the source of all true soul-based joy. However, the problem that we face, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is that the world's definition of happiness and, and God's definition of happiness are two different as things as well. And in fact, the world's definition of God and, our, and God's definition of God are completely different as well, which we'll be talking about more tomorrow. So, so the question with regard to happiness, happiness often comes from the meeting of addictions and that's not going to be a place of long-term joy for you if you continue to have your addictions met um, but you can have temporary happiness through having your addictions met there are many people in the world and many people in the spirit world who are doing that so you've got to be careful assessing love through the process of happiness does that make sense there's got to be you've got to be careful about your assessment I'm happy so therefore I'm in love does not necessarily follow. Um, I think a few months ago, yeah, when we were in Greece, we talked about the addictions between two, a couple, for example. Remember I drew, you know, the two stick figures we normally drew? And I talked about the open chakras between each couple in those talks. Like, if you haven't seen them, they're, I think, downloadable on YouTube now, aren't they? Um, and the reality is that more... The more of my chakras, addictions, that get met by, by the other person, the more happier and sexually attracted to them I will feel. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm actually, in, at the soul, happy or feeling joy or love. Mm. So that's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? You're trying to measure things through happiness? Doesn't always come out love. Yeah. Any other questions? Somebody else had a question straight behind you, actually. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm just wondering, how can you tell the difference between God's love and a spirit projecting so-called love? Just based on the channeling that Nina did, and she said she didn't feel love when she was with you and Mary, but when she went away, she did. How can we tell the difference? Well, firstly, would God's love be selectable like that? No. No. So she was basically saying in her channeling that um, 
her, myself or Mary being in her presence prevented her from feeling love. Now, would God's love being, be prevented by anybody in your vicinity? No. No. So therefore, if it is being prevented, then it has to be something to do with an addiction. Does that make sense? Because God would never prevent, from God's perspective, no matter what situation in, she wants to give you love. So if you're in the company of people who actually want to teach you of love and you're not feeling any love, then you've got to start questioning who you're getting the love from. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so what's, the, what, what's your feelings when I say something like that? It's true, but, but what's the feelings that many of you have? Like, I can feel in you, oh no, like I'm asking for love from God, but I might be getting love from a spirit. No, 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 should, should I do that? Should I do that? What do I do now? So, and that's what I mean, like how can we individually tell the difference if it's God's love? Or God's no love is never the result of an addiction. The only way for you to tell the difference is to know what you're addicted to. Yeah. It comes back to self-responsibility. It does. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Um, do you want to say something about it? Graham? Can we go, Graham? Do you want to say something about it too, Ben? Uh, no, no, you need to. Can Tris can bring the mic? Are you going to come up here? Is it teaching or are you asking questions? <laughs> I'm trying to get Mary. If she's going to teach, she's got to. Otherwise. <laughs> come on. It's both. It's a question yeah, yeah. which I feel is teaching. Um, wouldn't the way to discern that? I I think about. I'm very aware of my addictions, mm -hmm. and and as I've gone on, I've developed a sense of the hmm, happy feeling I get. That is actually now feels icky because I can feel it's an addictive sort of happiness. Yeah, you'll get to the point where your addictions actually feel painful, not pleasurable. Even if I get a warm, fuzzy feeling, I still go, ooh. It's it feels it. sleazy. Yeah. For the feeling. Yeah, I feel like, oh, something was off in that exchange with that person. Even though we both went, oh, it felt kind of icky. Yeah. Um, but I also feel that a discernment about the qualities of love has helped me with that. Certainly. Like, if, I, if I'm feeling good and I'm feeling good, but I know about love and I know I'm not practicing love with people then something's off if i can feel really like because sometimes it's challenging to step you know you have to face a lot of fears as we said not live in my fear but confront my fear to take a loving action yep. um the feeling i get from that is a much nicer quality of feeling that feels like i'm in harmony with god's love uh, yeah i should have asked the question <laughs> <laughs> so what's the question about <laughs> Um, I, my question is, if, well, my theory is, if I'm not growing in love, any feeling I'm getting from outside of myself is not from God. No, no. <laughs> um, it's very true. God is giving, God has an inbuilt feedback me mechanism for me yep. to help my soul grow. Yep. So if I'm, if I can visibly see my life is not changing and I'm not growing in love, but I'm getting nice feelings. Not something's God. off Obvious. if if i feel I, and you can feel yourself growing and and then i'm getting nice feelings from outside myself then i know okay i'm i'm There's in this relationship with yeah, mm. yeah. With, yeah. yeah. True. but i feel also if you really want to know the truth about this you do know the truth about it it's just that often we don't want to know yeah, totally. Because there's a feeling I get from my guides and there's a feeling I get from God they're also lovely but they're discernible to me now um, as, as is an addictive feeling from another person yep. um, or a spirit. Yeah. yeah, You've got to want to know your addictions before you'll actually notice uh, what's loving and what isn't. Because if you don't know your addictions and you're just living in them, at, at the end of the day all you're going to be doing is, is following your addictions and feeling nice when they get met and feeling bad when they don't. And uh, until you're out of your addictions and noticing your addictions, it's very, very hard to determine where you're receiving love from. However, may I point something out to you? The whole reason why we're having this conversation yeah. is so that you can tell the difference. Exactly, yeah. If you look at this... Okay, now I'm going. Yeah, yeah, you can go back. Thanks. <laughs> if you look at this, if any time you love somebody and it feels painful, you know you're in an addiction. If any time you feel love for somebody and you're feeling quite demanding of them, 
you know you're in an addiction. Any time that you feel, oh, I'm, I'm having to sacrifice myself again, I'm having to do something for them again, why, why can't they do it for themselves? <laughs> then, I think, then I think love is a sacrifice and I'm in an addiction. And if I go, where's the justice here? Where's the justice here? There's no justice here. You know, they should do for me what I did for them. If they don't, then there's no justice. And if I'm feeling that, I'm in an addiction. I'm not understanding love. Now, if I'm doing that and feeling love from someone in the spirit, in spirit, like a, like a spirit, or what I think is God, do you think that's coming from God? When God has these opinions of love? Obviously not. So where's it coming from? It's coming from a person who's willing to meet these addictions in you. That's where it's coming from. So I feel, I feel the more armed you are with truth surrounding what the world's definition of love is and what God's view of love is, the more you know what God's view of love is, even intellectually, you can easily tell where the love feelings are coming from if you allow yourself to notice. You don't need to be afraid of it. You just need to go, oh yeah, here we go again. Another spirit giving me a nice feeling. Yeah, and Frank, yeah, I still feel demanding. Yeah, okay. This is just a spirit giving me a nice feeling. Definitely not coming from God. Yeah. Far away, darling. <laughs> <laughs> you want to come back up again? <laughs> she doesn't want to teach. <laughs> um, no, no, she, she doesn't want to teach. Does she want to teach? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> The, well, the reason I'm not teaching is because I realised I had a lot of fear that was affecting the purity of what I was teaching. Yeah. And so I'm trying to work through that. But yeah. anyway, I can't. <laughs> Ang anger, I feel that if I still have a lot of anger inside of myself, God is... Uh, now I'm all kerfuffled. Uh, um, when there's a lot of anger, God is not giving me love. <laughs> Do you know? And as I work, like, if there's a lot of anger in my life, I really know that I'm far from love. These things all create anger. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's just what I've noticed, that the, the less anger I have, the more I, I know I'm developing in love, but also I feel more of a God connection. Yeah, it's very that makes true. Sense. Well, of <laughs> course, because, because anger, remember, is the result of you choosing anger to meet an addiction so whenever you are in anger you know you're not going to be receiving love from God you might receive a lot of approval and acceptance emotions from spirits in that place and you definitely will in many cases receive those but you're certainly not going to be receiving love from God so um, I feel that it's a lot, lot to do with you know that's why we had the discussion before the break about uh, how our anger and our terror work you know how our terror and our fear generate if we choose to be powerful we choose to to try to get the addiction met then it will automatically result in anger or rage if i'm in anger or rage or i've got a tendency to want to go towards anger and rage then obviously i'm yet to deal with my addictions so therefore I'm yet to really experience love from God in a lot of ways because I'm still heavily in my addictions. The logic tells me that God is going to be able to love me more the more I grow in love. And when I live in my addictions, he can't give me love. So the reality that for me is that I had to face a lot of time without receiving very much of God's love because I was really entrenched in a lot of addictions. And, um, it, yeah. Mm. This is why I feel it's so important to talk about what is love and what isn't love. And yeah. uh, I feel so passionate about God, but it's really important that we understand, like you said, God's view mm. of things. Yeah. 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 Does that make sense, Michelle? Does that answer your question? Like, um, um, can we have a mic back up? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. 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 It, it, it does. Yeah. 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 You don't need to worry so much. You need to let yourself feel more. You see, when we ask questions like, but is it a spirit, if it's not a spirit, that's us worrying, that's called a fear. <laughs> right? And when we worry, we're afraid. So let yourself feel your fear. What's your fear? Getting you, it wrong. 
fear of getting it wrong. Being told off. But why would you worry about getting it wrong? Because you're worried about getting told off. How do you feel when you get told off? Ashamed and small and powerless. So the emotion you're trying to prevent by asking the question is? The powerlessness. The powerless and emotion of and feeling ashamed and humiliated. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds so easy when you say it. <laughs> That's because it is easy. <laughs> If we're willing to feel the emotion. Like, the only reason why it's easy for me is I'm going, feel this, feel this, feel this. I'm feeling Rochelle, feeling Rochelle, feeling Rochelle. As I'm open to feeling you as much as I'm open to feeling myself. And therefore, open to feeling your emotions as much as I'm open to feeling my own. And if that, if that happens, then I can go, oh, it's this, 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 take the train down, there it is. It's right, quite easy. But... The reality is there's resistance inside of you of feeling the emotion of humiliation. So therefore, there's a desire to avoid the emotion of humiliation by asking the question. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Graham? Uh, <clears throat> I uh, had a question, but I realised that I already knew the answer. Ah. <laughs> and then I just occurred to me now that, well, why did I want to ask the question in the first place? So what's the emotion that uh, drove the desire? I was just wondering whether it might have been a spirit sort of wanting to know the question, wanting to know the answer or something. Okay, if it was a spirit and, and you know the answer, you could just tell them, can't you? Yeah. 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 Yeah, but so I have no question. No worries. <laughs> Come to Lawleen and then across. To if you just keep Keep your hand up for Sue. Sue, if you can bring your mic down here. Thanks, Molly. Um, if, if I'm... Uh, oh. Oh. I'm in a relationship again with my ex-partner, mm -hmm. believing him to be my soulmate. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought that I'd let it go its path and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it concerns me because it's going so nicely. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> and, and I look at all these things mm -hmm. and I say, at the time that I've been with him, it has not been painful, demanding, sacrifice or justice, I feel. Mm -hmm. But I know that I have all those addictions and I haven't worked through them all. Right. So... Is it at the time when I'm with the person and experiencing whatever I feel, uh, could it be okay? I mean, <laughs> ah. <laughs> you're now asking me to be the arbitrator no, of, well. your, of your relationship, which I cannot do. But let me answer your question. If I know that I have all of these beliefs in me still, yeah. and therefore a lot of addictions which maintain those beliefs, then there is a high likelihood, isn't there, that my relationship is in an addictive phase, obviously, where I'm meeting his addictions, he's meeting my addictions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So highly likely that it's an addictive phase. That doesn't mean go, oh, my relationship's in an addictive phase, let's end the relationship. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is deal with the addictions. So, so you go, okay, why do I feel so nice? Right. Is it because I'm in this place where I'm in love and, and it's not painful to me anymore? What happens if he cheats on me tomorrow? How would I feel then? Would you feel pain then? Uh, probably. Okay. So if I'm going to feel pain under that circumstance, then I've still obviously got an addiction in play. So do I wait till it happens or...? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why would you wait till it happens? <laughs> because I, I don't know... What the likelihood is if you wait till it happens, then your soul is going to be a part of the contributor of it happening because you're not dealing with the addiction inside of you and so your soul attraction is going to attract the event happening. Wouldn't it be better to go, yeah, I can feel that there's going to be a lot of jealousy and a lot of pain in me if he cheated on me? Wouldn't it be better to just feel about that now rather than wait until the event? Yes. Um. Okay, so let's say he wakes up one morning and say, what did you dream last night? So you're holding me in your arms and he says, what do you dream like? Oh, he said, oh, well, I dreamt I was having sex with this other lady. So there's, there's, a, 
if he was honest, he might have, have dreamt that. And, uh, and if, he, if you've got an honest relationship, you'd tell each other probably your dreams. Myself and Mary do um, all the time because we find that there's a lot of truth in the dreams in terms of what needs to be dealt with emotionally. So, so you tell each other your dreams and he tells you that. How would you feel? To be honest, um, I feel that um, uh, I, I've got quite a lot of error in that area and mm. I don't think I'd be jealous. Okay, so you feel like you deserve it? Probably, if that's the way I feel, yeah. All right, okay. So, so if that's the feeling you'd have, then you're willing to put up with and maintain a relationship with a person who obviously hasn't got a complete heart towards yourself. No, I wouldn't do that either. Well, that's what I think I wouldn't do. I no, I'm saying you would. Oh, okay, I would. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying you would because you're already deprecating yourself in the relationship. Yeah. Now, if you look at the past when you were together, yeah. Who deprecated herself in the relationship? Me. Yeah. And who took dominant, a dominant position? You did. Okay. So can you see you've still got that emotion inside of you? Yeah. And how is your relationship going now? Are you deprecating yourself and him dominant still? <sighs> Breathe. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. Is it not been going long enough to know? No. Okay. It's just a... But I guess the answer might be that if he's not being truthful to what's been happening, then that is what you're just saying, deprecation. Of. Yeah, what, I, what I'm saying to you is if both of you are being truthful, both of you are being honest, both of you are being open, both of you are being loving, mm -hmm. then both of you will be honest and open and loving with each other constantly. And in that process, if you engage that process fully, you will be bluntly... Uh, honest with each other and in the process of all this blunt honesty coming out of you different emotions will definitely get triggered definite emotions will definitely come up right then when they come up the idea is then to feel them engage them and feel them that's the idea most of us don't even let those emotions come up because we don't even get to the point of being honest with each other with everything that we feel so the reality, unfortunately, for many relationships is I think a certain thing, but I don't say it. And my partner thinks a certain thing and doesn't say it to me. And I might start thinking a certain thing and saying it to them, mm. expecting that they would do the same to me. But I have to be realistic. Are they doing the same to me? Do they have the same goals and desires or, or not? Well, that's what I feel. I, I feel that he's not. I, I don't. I feel that I try to be anyway, as honest mm. as I can be. Mm -hmm. But he's not with me. So does that mean? If can, he's can I just ask you a question? What's this statement? As honest as I can. Um, I've. I. So I'm a bit confused about that statement. Yeah, uh, I've always thought that I was as honest as I could be, but. I think I'm a bit discovering that um, and through all the addictions and things, um, I've just been kidding myself. Um, yeah, can I point out that most people have an internal dialogue. Is that not true? Mm -hmm. Many of you have experienced this where you have an internal dialogue going on and the internal dialogue very rarely matches their external dialogue. Now... For many of us, this has been a pattern that we learnt very, very young. Very young. Child, child, very young. You know, next door neighbour comes over and we, we're looking up at the next door neighbour and go, Mummy doesn't like you. Because <laughs> Mummy's told us she doesn't like her, right? And so we just say, Mummy doesn't like you. And what does Mummy do? It's whack, that's not true. How dare you say that? No, I like you. Give her a hug. <laughs> You know, and then when she walks out the door, I don't like her actually, but don't you ever say that anymore, right? So what do we learn to do? We learn to falsify the actual internal dialogue to make it pleasant and palatable to the receiver, to the potential receiver. We do this with our parents first, and then our parents usually have taught us to do it with everyone around us. Now, the problem with that is our internal dialogue is exactly, is far more a mirror of what's going on in our soul than anything else is. 
it's definitely our external dialogue is not a mirror of what's going on in our soul because because when we were young we were, that was beaten out of us generally or punished out of us so for most of us the internal dialogue is the truth or more truth that's the truth we want to access now what's the fast way to access internal dialogue it's just to learn to say the words that are actually going on inside the head all right just to say it and then go whoa <laughs> did i <laughs> did i say that you know like whoa see that's pretty dark that one you know and allow ourselves to without judgment notice that it's actually going through us and then we can start working with that you see we can start working with that and we actually through that process can engage others help by just saying exactly what's going on now we do this most often in relationships unfortunately because we have a huge investment in relationships and many of you in fact have a huge investment in the soulmate relationship and when I say you have an investment you have an investment of it working out right because there's a huge amount of fear if it doesn't work out what am I going to be left with nada <laughs> nothing right I'm going to be alone unwanted and uncared for for the rest of my life is the feeling right that we don't want to feel and so what we do is we have a tendency then to falsify what goes on in the relationship in other words we we accept things in what we believe to be a soulmate relationship that we would not normally accept in a standard relationship and that is the beginning of our error one thing that uh, we want to talk about soulmates a bit more myself and Mary in, in uh, a few months time probably will be you see one thing I wanted to point out to you just as a general comment there's bucket loads of truth yet right? anyway some, there's a lot more about soulmates that we want to talk about but one basic truth about soulmates Lorraine that's very important is truth is what binds the two halves together truth truth is the open is the thing that creates all openings of love between the two halves of the soul so if you cannot be truthful and honest and open with the partner and I'm not talking about the veneer layer of truthful and honest and open I'm talking about the real deep dark really unpleasant feelings that we have and and also we've got to be careful about blaming our soulmate for them because they all came from before we met our soulmate uh, have they not they've all come from usually our parents and and the environment we've grown up so therefore if I'm saying you're like this you're like that I'm really saying daddy's like this daddy's like that you know if I'm saying if, I, if, if I'm in a relationship with yourself you're a woman and I'm a male and I'm saying you're like this you're like that you're like this I'm really saying one of two things I'm saying mummy's like that mummy's like that mummy's like that or I'm saying dad thinks mummy's like that <laughs> right and I'm not really um, dealing with you as an individual I'm dealing with all of these unhealed emotions from my parents that I'm now applying across this relationship and if I continue to do that that's not really being honest the honest thing is to say yeah my dad was like that my mum was like that you know that's the more honest thing to do because that's going to get me closer to the truth of the emotions but when you say being as honest as you can the reality is that you can be perfectly honest all of you are capable of being perfectly honest when you say as honest as I can you are now introducing the fear in your honesty all right and to be honest most of us have terrible amounts of fear about honesty because almost every time when you were little you told the truth when mummy and daddy didn't like it what happened to you all oh, hell broke loose you had a screaming maniac with a usually a stick or some other weapon in their hand going for you when you did that right that's our, that's something that's terrifying and this is where we get back to our terror 
and it's the same thing with uh, so the the honest as I can starts with the fear and in the end there's a lot of terror in that statement there's a lot of fear terror about being truthful and being honest and being open no matter what no matter what the result because the result in our childhood is often very very harsh treatment of honesty yeah now um, my suggestion in the relationship though is just to look at all right allow myself to see God's view of love and when and anything comes up just engage the situation in truth and honesty completely perfectly which you are capable of doing and allow yourself to say the truth and then notice what happens then if all hell breaks loose in the relationship you go yeah this relationship isn't quite as truthful as I thought I could be in it and there goes my addiction so I also see that I must have been having an addiction in prior to that otherwise I w would have found that out sooner most probably for myself uh, I, I had one relationship for 13 years I was married for 13 years and that entire time we did not have a single argument uh. but did that make it a a loving relationship um, my partner he was married for um, well, something like 25 years and he prides himself on never having an argument yeah. until later on yeah. and and that's where um, I have a lot of difficulty in myself that uh, I don't believe what he tells me and that's well there's only two reasons why um, uh, generally there's only well there's three potential reasons why a couple won't have an argument at some point the first reason is they're both at one with God <laughs> now that's obviously not my case or yours okay so there's there's that one gone the second reason is that one or the other so one of us is pandering to the other's emotional addictions uh, and obviously the third is both of us are pandering to each other's emotional addictions you see you see if we're not in at one moment with God and we have a perfect relationship it has to be an addiction does everyone get that if we're not in at one moment with God which means we're perfectly now cleared of all emotional injuries we're in harmony with love completely as God designed us to be and if we're not in that space and we have what we believe is a perfect relationship or a, or a good relationship then both of us have to be in addictions There's, that's the only other option that's the basic truth about a relationship isn't it <laughs> no one wants a relationship now <laughs> or, or you're going oh no how many addictions have I got <laughs> does everyone understand that basic statement don't want to understand that basic statement no that one just goes in and out the other ear that one um, but it is a truth if we feel we have a good relationship that is without any turmoil in in it and we are not yet at one with God then we are in codependent addictions we, we have to be in codependent addiction for that to happen now that a codependent addiction in a relationship is very hard to work your way through the reason why is both of you are meeting each other's addictions and it's all it's automatic if it's such a good relationship it has to be automatic and for that to occur it's going to take one or both of you starting to see the codependent addictions that are in play and address them that's a challenge isn't it um, what I've noticed happen many times is if God is taken out of the picture in a relationship and you just focus on the happiness in the relationship right you will find that many people will be completely satisfied with their relationship otherwise they wouldn't be in one most of the time Right. particularly nowadays when it's easier to leave the relationship and go and find something that's more satisfying or fulfilling however 
when you add God to the relationship, now if you're both progressing towards God, that is going to become the measure of the addiction you're in. So no longer is the happiness of the relationship the paramount position, but rather the growth of the relationship becomes a more important position. Do you, do you see the difference? It's not the relationship staying in a safe, safe stable and non-confronting place that is where you would like to be, but rather there's an expectation of continual growth. And when you engage this growth, a very interesting thing happens you become very close, much closer than it's capable of doing when you're in the addiction. Right? And that's what we're finding, isn't it, Mary? Like as, as we work through the different addictions that are in play, what's happening is you become closer and closer and closer. It doesn't mean there's no turmoil. Right? The reality is Mary just spent two months living somewhere else in our relationship because she had all this fear to deal with and I found myself pandering to her fear and she found herself wanting me to pander to her fear which stopped her from getting into her fear so we both decided well it's better for me to work, work through pandering to Mary's fear and work through my fears about Mary's being harmed and Mary being hurt which is all first century stuff for me and then Mary working through her terror of fear itself and getting into the process where she can feel her terror. That's better to do that apart. And we will be closer if we do that than we would be if we still continue to pander to each other, sphere or terror together. Right? And if you do that, you will get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And until you become at one with your soulmate, which is, which is actually a time that will happen after you're at one with God not before right and so you become at one with god first then at one with your soulmate obviously there's a lot to learn between at one moment with god to at one moment with your soulmate it's a lot more difficult to become at one with your soulmate than it is to become at one with god right because god's not got any injuries <laughs> so you know if there's no at one moment occurring it's got to be your injuries right <laughs> The problem with becoming at one with your soulmate is, particularly initially, both of you got injuries. So how do you work out which ones, which, which, which ones, which ones the injury and which ones the pure state? But when when you involve God in the process, now both of you are working towards God. So you have now the option of discovering every injury within yourself, which is also going to automatically bring you towards your soulmate. And this is why we discuss this world's definition of love because without knowing the difference between how God sees things and how the world sees things, this is what we've grown up with. This is how we view things. And without us recognising, wow, well, yeah, I do feel love is painful, but it's not painful in my relationship. That's interesting. There's a good chance that I'm in an addiction in my relationship, isn't there? Right? There's a good chance because if I still feel inside of me that love is painful and my relationship isn't creating any pain, then there must be some kind of conflict in there at the soul level that I'm not recognising. I've still got a false belief in me but I feel happy with it. So something's going on and it has to be going on. The key is for me to see that and acknowledge that and then allow, pray and set your intention with, your, with the desire that you have inside of yourself, set your intention to discover what it is. If you set your intention, very rapidly, generally, you discover what it is and you'll grow. And if you grow, there's a high likelihood your other half, whoever that is, will grow along with you. There's a high likelihood of that happening. Dennis, thanks. We have the mic over there. Thanks. Thank you. This is also true of um, a friendship. That, that rather than, you know, if we're in in this codependent friendship, then mm -hmm. hey, we're in the same place. Exactly. And we are. Will help us grow anyway. That's right. Yeah. A codependent friendship is not going to help you grow. It's going to help you stay in the same place. That's it. A, a, a challenging friendship is going to help you grow. Yeah. yeah. So you, you want challenging relationships. 
they'll all help you grow if you allow yourself to work your way through it emotionally that's very important um this is probably a, an addiction but i still feel i've got to say what i'm feeling is um most of my life on the natural love path i've tried to find a, a shortcut to know god's view yep and now that i'm passionate about the divine love path and i'm still aware that i keep reverting back to the shortcut yeah. to um, the natural love path yeah yeah and by the way i don't feel the natural love path is a shortcut do you uh no, no. it's just it's actually hard to say what i'm trying to say yeah, yeah, far away um what's the difference between us not being able to stay uh and work through our addictions on the divine love path and you being able to so elegantly stand up there and know it so well is there something different between us and you that you got it and you're you're growing in love and helping us but we're not we don't seem to be growing as fast is that i don't understand a, there is a large difference I, i'm remembering it you're having to learn it for the first time thank you <laughs> so learning it for the first time is different than remembering learning for, for the first time has a lot of problems associated with it you see um, this view inside of myself and the others of the 14 this view is actually the view that we have lived with for 2000 years so it's pretty firmly cemented in us and all we've got to be is open to connecting to that view open to the concept and deal with any of the terrors that we have of opening to that concept part one of which is opening to our own identity and everything else and if we're willing to deal with those terrors then all of god's view will just flood into us like a and that's how it feels for both myself and mary it just floods in and the others of 14 when they once they go through their terror which is the pr primary thing that one of the 14 has to do go through terror and every one of the 14 was tortured to death so we've got quite a lot of terror and once we go through the terror then this sort of viewpoint just floods to us and it's like oh yeah that's right oh yeah that's right oh yeah that's right and it's all there automatically inside without having it to be enter us did Is you that? yeah that's that's yeah yep. did you yep. have to feel before you got the memory or did it memory come first and then no no feel before the memory yeah i have to we had to feel our terrors we had to go through our terror for the when i was in my first time discovering I'm go I was going through the same process as you're going through now. The first time discovering, which is my life in the first century, Mary's life in the first century, that was our first time discovering these truths. You follow me? Now, the first time discovering, it took me 31 years to get from the sixth sphere to the eighth sphere. 31 years in my first time discovering on earth. There was a lot of opposition obviously around as well it was a very different environment to the environment we have now and so forth but it took a long time to make the transition of those two dimensions you follow now and there's a good reason for that and that is the first time you're learning everything from scratch and you're not learning it here see we're so used to learning it here aren't we you know you go to the go to the school where do you where do you get taught at school so all what goes in here isn't it how did you learn your times tables it's all here right why is it that there's some people like some people who have uh, what is it called uh, no autism. Aut autism who have never been to school and learned their times tables and yet they can give you pi to 28 decimal places or 50 decimal places and they can work all, all this mathematics out. Why is that? And yet, I had to go there. One times one is one. One times two is two. One times three is three. Right? And I had to go through my 12 times tables, and, and that's the way I learned. And the trouble is today, the majority of us have learned this way. The majority of us learnt, have learned in the head, in our mind. And so, what we've learned to do here is not the same as learning here. We've, it's like we've got to. It's like we've got to throw out all the old way of learning, yeah, yeah. right? Which is actually natural that we beat out of children or, you know, most of us, particularly those of us who are a bit older, have had it literally beaten out of us at school. But we have to throw all of that old way of learning out and then learn this new way. Now, that, that's pretty hard. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so hard because 
we've grown up with all of this world's view of everything, not just the world's view of love, but the world's view of absolutely everything, including the world's view of learning and what is the appropriate way to learn. And so we've grown up in this system where we've got all these different ways of learning that we've been shoved down our throat, basically, or put into our mind. And now we've got to throw away this way of learning and learn the way God designed for us to learn which in itself has huge emotional impact upon our environment because everyone says, what, you are not or what? You know, like, that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't get that. And right the way through to wanting to attack you because you're doing it. And so we get all of this pressure and like, there's so much that has to be undone. And this is the problem with learning all of these things for the first time. We're having to undo the bad learning we're having then to be open to the new learning, the way of learning, and then we have to learn it. And that is an effort. It is an effort, and you're going to struggle through that effort. Now, in the spirit world, it's a little easier, but to be frank, not very much easier than that. I've talked to many spirits in the spirit world who have spent thousands of years still trying to learn the divine love path, but still never got it, because they want to hold on to the intellect. You know, there's been a group of spirits that have been hanging around us for nearly five or six years um, who, are, who are sixth fear spirits. They're in the sixth dimension of the spirit world. Um, almost every opportunity they get, they come to channel through somebody to talk to me. And they open the conversation with, um, we would like to ask you a few questions. <laughs> it always starts like that. We would like to ask you a few questions about how to progress on the divine love path. That's how it starts. And we finish up having a one hour conversation or so. And in the end, I know they're going to go away and try to understand with their mind what they just heard. Because they're, they're just finding it really hard to, to give up the learned process. And, and that, that's what I'm going through. It's yep. just so difficult. And I, sometimes I feel for you that like, is there somebody else in the world that's teach, teaching what you're teaching? So the... You, I've learnt that if there's more people doing the same thing, then more people can learn the same thing. But it seems like that you're the only one that's teaching this. Well, the reality is that every one of the 14 has, the, has this in their soul. So they could engage the process of teaching it. However, they have all of their fears associated with doing so, including their fear of their own identity and having to face up to their own past, which is very, very confronting. So until they do that, there will be just myself teaching it and then once one of the others do it and so forth and then there'll be a group teaching it and so forth. But, but I can't, you can't expect that to happen without the free will of those individuals being involved. Which leads me to my last question. Thanks, AJ. And that is, after the earth shift, mm -hmm. is there a change in opportunity in our progression um, on the divine love path because something's happened to mother earth that affects our minds or is it just it's the same thing all over no change no the the uh, any earth changes that occur are not the result of uh, are, are an effect and not a cause the cause is this this different differential between the amount of fear that's on the earth and the amount of love that god is now pushing through the universe and the discrepancy between those two points creates opposition between truth and error and, and the earth is going to work that out, like that opposition between truth and error will be worked out on the earth for the earth itself, like the earth itself is going through, it will go through the fractures it will go through as a result of this opposition between the love that's hitting it and the amount of fear and terror and, and, and untruth that's on the earth itself. Now. It is an opportunity, but, but the re reality is that it could be an opportunity in a negative direction. It just depends on the choice that collectively mankind makes. Now, like our, our personal goal is to help mankind make a loving choice, but we don't have control over mankind's choice. So mankind can make an unloving choice if they wish. It's up to them. And there are many spirits in the spirit world who are rubbing their hands together with glee, waiting for earth changes so they can actually create more terror. And many of you are terrified of the potential of earth changes, so much so that you don't even want to know that they're going to happen, because you're worried about anarchy. Aren't you? Many of you still worried about anarchy. And 
you know, you see movies like The Road and other kinds of movies like that that portray an anarchy based world. And, uh, you know, a lot of these horror movies as well, you know, the 28 days and the 28 weeks later and all those ones where everything just goes crazy. Um, and we have lots of, of fear about all of that. And that is also a potential. The potential is that mankind can take that road uh, as well. Now, we don't feel that that's... I, well, I personally don't feel that's potential. Mary's not thoroughly convinced at this point that that's not the potential. I feel there's a great loving potential uh, as yeah, but God the always creates. But, but I the reality is that you actually also have an emotion in you at the moment yes, of which is hopelessness about the world's condition. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also a sense that people are waiting for a change from outside of them to take an opportunity which is already among us right now. And unless we take it, when the change comes from outside of us, yeah. it's... But many, that's my emotion. No, it's very true. And Ma what Mary's saying is that many are waiting for earth changes to cause change instead of realising the basic fundamental truth that all of us must realise, and that is this. Nothing will change unless I change. That's the fundamental truth. Nothing will change externally in my environment until and unless I desire to change. And what we often talk about myself and Mary is how is trying to encourage the desire in people to change rather than waiting for specific events that will cause the change because because that's just a very powerless place really to do that and remember that powerless is not love yeah, yeah. so um, I feel quite strongly that uh, you know there are opportunities coming uh, upon us to deal with things and the opportunities are not because of earth changes they are specifically because God is putting more and more of her love through the universe that comes out of these black holes in the universe and through the system and and we have an opportunity to respond to that love and change or to oppose it we, we that's the choice now the problem that we face in the world is the world opposes it most of the world opposes it and so for us to accept it we're going to finish up being opposed by the world this makes it, more difficult. it does make it difficult because not only do we have to change ourselves, but now we're having all this opposition from an external force trying to keep us back into the little tub that we were in in the, in the prison that we were, we were in and that's the struggle we have we've got we've got lots of forces trying to keep us in the prison that we were in and then we've got god's love helping us to draw to evolve into love and, and get out of the prison that we're in and we have the choice to follow either direction but the fear in us which we have yet to release dictates we follow the world's view and this is why I say, without feeling the terror and fear within you, you are never going to accept God's view. Because the fear within us is going to dictate to us to follow the world's view, which is a world's view, which is a fear-based view. And until we sort that out and allow ourselves to feel that terror and work our way through it, we are not going to feel God's view. So while I'm presenting the world's definition of love and comparing that with God's view of love in these sessions, for many of us, we will never accept this view on this side. We will never accept God's view until we deal with our terror, until we deal with our fear. That's why fear is such a very important emotion, to allow yourself to feel. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> going back to um, trusting... Um, w what you feel is love or not. Um, I've been doing this thing for a couple years where, um, and you could correct me if this is wrong, but the premise is that on some level we can perceive our soul and, um, and to relay whatever feeling, whatever truth, whatever experience we have, uh, to relay it through that space wherever we could perceive it. Mm -hmm. um, is that 
um, you know, like, I guess my question is... How well, Alexis, does a child do that? No. So, uh, so, and we want to become like a child. Yeah, I did it because I feel, what I found was that my mind and my eyes are often deceiving me. I agree. Very easily. Yep. And that, so I went from the idea of trying to think it or conceptualize it into a place where I could bring it into an experience. Uh, right. But no, it's not what a kid does. I understand the motivation, yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's my, you know, it's like, is that, I guess that's kind of a long way around the, the way, huh? It is the long, it is a way a natural love spirit would choose to develop, yeah. certainly. It's a way that a person would choose to develop by using their intellect to tune into their emotional feelings and to feel the resonance within their soul towards a specific thing. What I'm saying though to you is, once the opposition to that releases from your soul, yeah. that will be an automatic process that you don't have to engage in an intellectual yeah, I way. I understand, yeah. Yep. I mean, I, I understand, I also know very much that there's all this other crap that's bugging it. I mean, that's the whole reason why I actually do it, is because exactly. I've been worried that this, this junk's gonna like, you know. And that's the thing, is that we're often doing an intellectual thing in our spirit body's mind, which is about our real brain, yeah. to skip over what's actually happening at the soul level in opposition to it. Uh -huh. Right? Now, the key is to get what's going on in the soul as much as possible, so that we don't have to skip over anything and we can just go to it, release it, and then it no longer influences us anymore. So what I'm perceiving is, is not necessarily my soul, but just an aspect of my spirit body? Uh, no, I feel what you're perceiving in that moment is you're making a conscious effort in your mind yeah. to feel your soul's pure intention yes. and then to relay that back to your mind and then you make an intellectual decision. Exactly. But, but what I'm saying to you is a child does not do that. No. A child just feels and does yeah. in its soul. The fact that we can't is, is, a, is because in our soul there is darkness and if we feel and do then we'll sometimes do dark things right, right, yeah. and so we stop doing that and instead of releasing the reason for our darkness in our soul we work our mind to try to feel the pure part of our soul and this is very much a natural love practice that many spirits have encouraged in the spirit world for many many thousands of years but it is not going to help you become at one with God in the end what I don't understand is how can I be able to perceive that pure part of my soul without seeing also the darkness part when I relay such a, a perception? And by being selective in yeah. your emotional content, you can, you can allow certain emotions to pass through your soul without allowing others. I see. And this is where the mind starts kicking in and muddying the waters a bit, yeah. I feel. You're right. Um, so the, a lot of these practices, and this is like practices we have to undo, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and they are difficult practices to undo because we've learnt to do them for a reason. And the main reason why we've learnt to do them is because it helps us avoid any darkness in our soul, or more specifically, it helps us avoid acting upon any darkness in our right. soul. Yeah. Yep. And so that then allows us to see there's darkness in the soul, we have confusion about how to release it, so we don't bother releasing it. What we do instead is we engage this secondary process which actually ignores the darkness in the soul or skips over it and just tries to access the goodness in our soul. Right. But a child doesn't do it. No. So therefore it's not the way we were created to operate, right. it's the way we now operate because we're trying to deal with the darkness in our soul without feeling the darkness in our soul and releasing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, yep. So it, it certainly is a practice that you can use over and over again, but is it going to bring you to God's love? And the answer is no. Right. It'll certainly bring you to, work, to love. It'll bring you to natural love, right. certainly. Yeah. Yep. And so therefore it can't be, I can't dismiss it as an option, because love is better than no love. <laughs> Well, I mean, I do it for things like if I'm trying to make a decision and I have absolutely no idea, you know, because it's like a lot of things in life. Yeah. So then I just refer to that aspect of my soul mm -hmm. and see which one resonates best with it yep. and do it. Yep. Um, is that avoiding dark consequences? Am I, am I avoiding things or is that just a tool I use, but I shouldn't use it as a tool to, to, um, um, to avoid dark emotions? 
Well, in the end, as I've said to many spirits, using any tool is the result of fear at some level. I see. Yeah. Right. So there is a fear of a consequence if you don't use the exactly, tool. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So remember, anything that's fear-based is out of harmony with love. Yeah. So obviously, it's not going to bring you very quickly to a place of love. It's going to help you be loving yeah. uh, in action, but not in soul. Right. Yeah. Which, if you're in, be if you're love in your soul, you will automatically be love in action and love in words and love in speech and love in thoughts, uh -huh. automatically. Yeah. Whereas this way, you're having to fabricate a process to create the love. Mm -hmm. right? And this is uh, something that all of the spirits who are on the natural love path do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've talked to many of them doing that. Right, yeah. Yeah. And they're finding it very hard to give up because it's a very addictive process too because it helps you prevent a lot of dark... Uh, it yeah. prevents dark actions. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And many of them are worried that... Uh, I, I talked recently to a group of spirits who who were in, in the f fourth or fifth dimension and they're wanting to get to the you know, to celestial heavens but they weren't, on the na they weren't on the divine love path, they were on the natural love path and they were, they were trying to say to me that there's this process they're going through and they want me to explain things in the process they were going through they were wanting me to tell them what to do but in a way that they already could build upon what they already knew and I was saying to them, like, you know, you've got to give up what you already know in this because there's this whole aspect of the soul that you have not yet developed. You've developed your spirit body's mind and it's a pretty good mind, um, but you haven't developed the soul yet in terms of this other aspect. And them giving that up was very, very difficult for them. And uh, many of them did not want to do it. They, they left the conversation not wanting to do it. Some did it, but not, not all. Usually it's interesting when I have conversations with spirits. Sometimes with spirits in a first dimensional condition, I can talk to a million or a few million of them at a time and a few million of them will change all at once. And, and yet when I talk to the spirits in the sixth dimension, it's very... And, and sometimes I've had conversations with up to five to ten million of them at a time. Very few of them have changed at the time of our conversation. And it's because of this learned process that they're now being asked to give up. But it feels so attractive. Yeah, yeah but uh, as you say, it's, it's a tiring affair. Sorry? I said it's a tiring affair. It's, it's tiring, it's, yes. It's just life, managing life forever. It, it's management, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a child doesn't manage, a child just does. And if a child is in perfect harmony with love, everything it does will be in perfect harmony with love. Yeah. It doesn't have to think about it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Peter. You are mentioning before AJ about how it is slightly easier to um, progress on the divine love path when you're in the spirit world. Yet uh, and then you explained why. Uh, but when 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 you read the pageant messages, you read so many examples of uh, people who didn't know about the divine love path and who found out about it. And, and fairly rapidly, without any real explanation of how they did it, all of a sudden they're receiving God's divine love and they're making wonderful progress. Th there must be a huge amount of um, detail on actually what they did and how they did it that is left out. Yeah. Um, because there's a huge difference between saying, you know, it's a good idea to do this and then actually explaining... I agree. Um, the problem w with the pageant messages and with any channeled material is that if the person on earth who's channeling the material is resistive to the process, then you're not going to be able to accurately describe through them what the process is. So all you can do is describe that I went through a pro you say I went through a process and I'm now receiving divine love and so forth and so forth. You can't actually give the detail because the person on earth is blocked to the detail being received. And this is a problem that we have with channeling quite a lot still on earth is that when we are personally blocked to the information that could be transmitted to us then it's impossible for a spirit to transmit that information to us clearly and so most of the time a spirit in a celestial condition or a spirit on the divine love path will, will basically say well it's pointless me trying to channel that material because it's all just going to get muddied in the process of channeling it. It's better for me just to talk honestly about the situation and what happened 
and what's happening for me now and give some faith and courage and hope to the people on earth who are missing those qualities than it is to muddy the waters with a lot of false information that the medium is going to finish up writing down that's not what I'm saying. Right. Yep. So how does that apply how does that then relate to the process of, of us uh, praying for and, and asking God to receive divine love because when you read the pageant messages and even it says in the prayer that whenever you ask if you ask in a state of uh, you know a longing then, yeah. so uh, then can, can uh, you say what it says it says a longing can you do, do you understand what, what else does it say because it says quite a few words with this an earnestness what else aspirations what else it says with faith yeah desire is this is the terms that it uses in terms of asking for divine love yes right. earnest longing aspiration faith desire is there any other things that come to your mind when you've read the pageant messages passion, passion it uses the word passion very frequently And humility, in humility, talks about an awakening of the soul. But if we look at those, uh, remember in, when Mary says the awakening of soul, remember some of the messages say the soul must have its awakening to a certain process of truth. So it does talk about the awakening. Now, now can we see the pageant messages themselves are basically talking about what I'm talking about with you. They're talking about developing these qualities within yourself now what i'm saying to you is this what you've grown up with is what you currently have and this is what we've got to develop and this is not from the world's viewpoint but rather from god's right so what we've got to do is understand god's view of humility God's view of what earnestness is, God's view of what a longing is, God's view of what faith is, a desire is, a passion is, and so forth. And we've talked about many of these subjects with you already, right? Now, can you see that if, if I don't understand what they are and I only intellectually think I know what it is, then I'm already out of harmony with receiving it. Also, if this is based on my soul's longings and not my mind's longings which are two very different things right your mind can actually think one thing while your soul is feeling a completely different thing at the same time that's the reality of our, how we work now if i'm basic if i'm going in my mind i'm earnest but at the same time i don't want to hear any truth about my personal emotional condition Am I earnest? This is the condition yourself are in sometimes, Pete. Where in your mind you're earnest, but in your soul you don't want to see what's unloving inside of you. So you're not earnest. Does that make sense? So, so does that make the whole process of praying for divine love futile? To a degree, yes. Because remember, the prayer comes from your soul, not from your mind. So you would be better off praying, why don't I want to see myself truthfully? which is a better prayer than it would be I want God's love I want God's love while at the same time your your soul is going I don't want to know anything about my emotional condition <laughs> you can't have love without knowing about your emotional condition that's the reality and and we've got to have a earnest desire to know our emotional condition not just one that goes oh yeah can you tell me something about my emotional condition oh yeah that's interesting <laughs> right and we go away, we come back a week later. Can you tell me something more about my emotional condition? Oh, yeah, no worries. That's interesting too. You know, but we don't actually feel it inside of ourselves. We're not actually, we're not really wanting to know that, are we? But if every single day we're going with God, we're in this prayer with God, I really want to know what's inside of myself that prevents your love from entering me. And I really want to know here in my heart, I want to know, I have a desire to know. And unless that, and that desire, by the way, won't be just a statement anymore, will it? 
Every single action I take every single day will be based around this desire. Everything. My whole day will be based not around getting things done, working, whatever else. My whole day will be primarily, number one, will be my desire to know what's inside of me. Now, that is earnest. That's what earnestness is from God's point of view. It seems astonishing to me then that anyone could ever possibly receive any divine love given that everyone's got so much error in their soul yet you said previously yeah, I think that Peter you're being pretty harsh because many of mm. you in the audience have often been in this state of earnestness have you not like there's many times the problem we face is that we don't feel this state of earnestness every minute of every day that's the problem and so we're only going to receive divine love during the times of earnestness and longing sincere earnest oh that's the other word it uses sincere I better write that down too sincere earnest longing that that's the only time we're going to receive the divine love that's the only time and and what we've what we've got to realize is for many of us we are quite insincere most of our days with God and only sincere for minutes at a time generally with God and with our life like many of us are in huge addiction still so are we being sincere with God in our addiction definitely not we need to be a lot more open with God about our addictions and sincere about our addictions now when we have those feelings and they have to be feelings in our soul we will be receiving and if we have those feelings all the time we will be receiving divine love all the time the reality is because we've grown up in the world's view of everything it's going to be very hard initially for us to have any of these feelings so how do spirits in the spirit world actually magically um, transform themselves into um, having all those soul qualities um, seemingly like magic well firstly um, can I address the spirit who's with you asking all these questions Fine. can we do that sure this spirit with you has now been asking these questions of me for the last four years exactly these questions I've answered many of these questions time after time after time with you that is because you have a spirit with you who doesn't believe there's such a thing as divine love and has never personally felt it and what they're trying to do is they're trying to intellectually understand they want to know but they're trying to intellectually understand the process before they engage it and that is the source of all of your questions so that's number one this spirit is with you because you've had a life of teaching the natural love path for what 35 years at least 25 at least 25 and so it's very very hard for him and yourself to give up this addiction to the natural love path thirdly he does not the spirit with you does not understand like emotionally emotional earnestness he doesn't mm -hmm. understand it he, he can only get intellectual earnestness an intellectual desire an intellectual knowledge and he's struggling to get to the emotional questions so when you've got all of that influence upon you Peter then there's also a very strong desire inside of you to understand it all intellectually rather than just engage the process of knowledge I have had personal um, discussions with you as you know for many months uh, usually in fact I think I've probably spent more time with you personally than I have with anyone else in this room in terms of their personal emotional condition except for Mary <laughs> Sorry. Mar Mary's definitely had more of my time than you have and uh, no I can't think of anybody else that's probably had more of my time than you have actually and um, because we've had many many conversations particularly early days right and and what I what I've found in every conversation is that there is still the spirit is into influencing you still along this line of not wanting to know your personal unloving motivations and because there is this blindness to personal unloving motivations that then disallows any emotions about those motivations right and as a result of that there is a desire to hang on to the world's view of love instead of accepting God's view of love and that then prevents the flow of love into your soul and 
these things are an essential part and, and the spirit by the way keeps on bringing up the Paget messages to me all the time saying somehow that I'm conflicting with them however I am not the reality is the Paget messages use all of these terms for the reception of divine love right. and every one of them it says has to come from the soul in fact there were quite a number of messages that I actually wrote through Paget that talk about the discrepancy between what man thinks in his mind and what actually happens in his soul and we use these terms over and over again but they have to be from the soul not from the intellect and if you can if you can start to see that there's a pattern going on here and the pattern is that every one of these feelings and is an emotional feeling that has to be real in order for God's love to be received and in fact they have to be real for any love to be engaged do you understand what I mean by that like you can have a relationship with a partner but if you're not earnest in the relationship it's not love can you see if you don't have a longing in the relationship then it's not love if you're not having desire and passion and sincerity in the relationship then it's not love you're going to be feeling it's going to be addictions codependent addictions that you're in it's the same principle with God as it is with a partner in the sense that if these are not coming from your heart then it's all just a figment of your mind really a figment of your imagination that you're in love because you're not right? you're only in love when you feel the feelings of love flowing through you and coursing through your veins and the other person who you're with feels it strongly from you now we have an engagement of the actual emotions that are involved now the spirit with you Pete he doesn't want to engage the emotions and then he gives you influence to not engage yours and so what he does is he, he causes you to go into this line of like doing things rather than feeling things do, do you see and is, is it that he doesn't want to um, he doesn't want to know or that he doesn't know no he thinks to... he wants to know he, he thinks he wants to know a bit like you in fact <laughs> right <laughs> and this is how the law of attraction works he thinks he wants to know but he's still trying to use his mind to resolve it all and and it, and you can't discover or work through the divine love path by using your mind to discover it all you can't that's why there's still many many spirits in the sixth dimension who are in their mind who have yet to discover the divine love path because they're trying to use their mind to intellectualize it there's a book written um, you've heard of it, the Urantia book how many of you have heard of that 2,000 pages of spirits intellectualizing the physical workings of the universe not understanding it in their soul that's what it is right to 2000 rice paper pages <laughs> of that and and the re reality is any person reading it who's going to be attracted to it is only going to be another person who's in their mind because you could not be attracted to it any other way right <laughs> well it, uh, you read it twice yeah <laughs> and we know where you are don't we you've admitted that in the previous yeah so that's okay the key is to recognize it you don't need to condemn any of these things you, you know we've got to stop our judgments right we've just not, don't need to condemn any of these things we've just got to state them as truths for many of us who have come from the natural love path we are still in the natural love way of doing things and this applies Peter not just to you but to the majority of our audience still we're still in the natural love way of doing things because we've had years of learning it and it and it appeals to us it appeals to our fear and it appeals to our mind and that's why we struggle with the soul-based learning now what we need to do and the spirit with us with us who spirits who are with us need to do is need to understand that all of these words that we're now using can be used as intellectual words if we wish but if you look at all of them they all have feelings involved and it's the feeling engagement that's essential with love 
you can't say you love when you don't feel it. Right? Now the world is used to saying, I love you, without feeling any of it. And in fact, it gets worse than that. Our parents said they loved us while they had a stick in their hand beating us. Now that's a pretty big distortion of the feeling of love. Because what is the feeling coming out of them? A lot of the times, rage, anger, resentment, all sorts of emotions coming out of them, which they are calling <laughs> love. <laughs> While they are doing it. This is the case in your family, Pete. Your parents called a lot of things love, which were not loving. Now, as a result of that, we grow up in this world's view that love is all of these different things, right? And we enter, we enter this thing, we even look at the words and we, we don't even get the words because we've been taught that, no, that's the word my mum, dad, my mum used the word love and my mum used the word sincere and my dad used the word desire and, you know, they all use the words but the emotion coming out of them is what we learnt to associate with that word. So if the emotion coming out of them, I love you, is the word coming out, and the emotion coming out of them is this rage, what do we associate love with? Rage, or fear, or terror, of, you know, pain. We so automatic association. It's unavoidable. Now, instead of condemning ourselves for that, and I feel to an extent this is what you do sometimes when I have these conversations with you, Pete, is that you condemn yourself for not understanding. But the key is to allow yourself to go, okay, what I'm trying to do here is undo years of programming of the world's viewpoint, which my mother and father imbibed through their own life and which I imbibed as a result. And what I'm trying to do is undo this years and years of it. Now, initially, I'm not going to be very sincere about it. That's fact. I'm going to go, oh, there's an addiction to me. Now. There's another addiction. You beauty, I can be in addictions on the divine love path as well. You know, that's how we often feel, that we can stay feeling similar addictions and stay in the similar process, but just go on to a different path. You can't do that with God. God sees everything knows everything and feels everything from you. God knows what's within and God knows whether this is sincere or not. That's the truth. So, so when we engage our mind, as we often do, in the process of analysing the path, we are neglecting the soul. We are unfortunately still believing what the world's view is going to be the entire time even though we're hearing different words because unfortunately we put the same words to the things we've always believed them to be and this is where the problem I have talking to many spirits on the natural love path so I start talking about God and they go yeah 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 what do you believe God to be and then they sort of pause a bit and when you ask them a bit deeper questions they believe that they're God so, so every time I mention the word God they're not thinking some entity who has, is, the, is the lawmaker of the universe, they're not thinking that. They're thinking, me. <laughs> There's a big difference between those two. So they're going, yeah, I understand. I get love from God. I'm God, so therefore I'm getting love from myself to myself. <laughs> right. Do you see, like, I'm speaking these words that they are now interpreting through these different meanings and different that, that they've grown up with and, and many of them... Uh, um, encouraged over years and and so they think I'm speaking about the same thing but I'm not and there's no and I just have to so, stop saying so, sometimes and say look you believe that I'm speaking the same thing that you understand but I'm not I'm not how do you describe to somebody something when they believe that thing is something else they and they also believe they know what that thing is it's very hard and this is the problem that we have when addressing some of our spirit friends who are on the natural love path and also many people on earth are on the natural love path. We're often thinking that what's being spoken of is completely different.
to what I... So what happened to those um, fortunate people in the spirit world who, who actually got some help um, and after longing and whatever was able to receive divine love? I mean, well, one, one very simple thing happened. They learnt to be like a child. They, they undid, the very first thing they did was undid their method of learning. Something that you have yet to do and many people in the room have yet to do. They undid their method of learning that they preferred and now, now accepted God's method of learning. How did they do that? Well, it required a lot of humility. It requires a lot of giving up the mind and giving up the process and giving up, giving up this process that you've had for many, many years and now accepting this other process of what is really going on inside of me at any point in time emotionally, recognising it, being honest about it and reflecting it. This is something you're yet to prepare to do, just as many others in the audience are yet to prepare to do. Is that easier to do when you're a spirit? No, not necessarily. Not Because I, as I've said, I've talked to many spirits in the sixth dimension who, don't, who, who I've had many hundreds of conversations with and they still aren't doing it. So it's not necessarily easier. It just is something that needs to happen inside of ourselves that causes the switch between those two points. The first way of dealing with things in the mind is very fear-based. So it usually indicates there is a lot of fear in the person when they're doing it. Fear that they are in denial of. And I put to you that there's a lot of fear inside of you that you are in denial of that causes you to want to maintain this intellectual perspective. And the spirits with you. There's a lot of fear in them that they are in denial of that they want to maintain the intellectual perspective. You've got to allow yourself to even see the fear. Be willing to even see it. That's a part of humility. Most of us on earth are not willing to see. We don't want to see. We say we do because saying the words means that we get away with a lot of things. But we can't get away with things with God. So God can feel whether we're humble or not. So the reality is if I'm not receiving divine love, then it has to be something to do with me. Because it's definitely not something to do with God. God is perfect and God always responds to a sincere desire. So if I'm not receiving divine love, the only other person in the equation between God and me is me. And so it has to be something to do with me that I'm not giving up. And many times we get shown what it is every week, but we are so resistive to seeing it that we show, get, God shows us, no, shows us, no, shows us, no, shows us, no. Shall I keep going? Shows us, no. Because a lot of times it's like hundreds of times we've been shown the same, the same law, the law of attraction, has, has activated, a, a, in, you know, our soul activates it constantly and God is constantly through this law demonstrating the truth to us, which we ignore. Ignore again, ignore again, ignore again, ignore again. And we continue ignoring until we want, really want to see. And this is what I talk about the mirror, you know, looking at your face in the mirror. We do not often want to see the reflection. That's the reality. Now, what happened with many of the people in the spirit world is their reflection is for all to see. Every single person in the spirit world looks as bad as they feel. You know, if we looked as bad as we felt, it would be very positive for us generally. But the problem here on earth is there's a time delay between how we feel and how we look. Right? And because of that time delay, we can look in the mirror and think, yeah, everything's fine today, when everything ain't fine in, today, in here today. There's emotions of anger, rage, there's emotions of where I'd really like to kill that person, I'm sick of this person. There's emotions of, you know, wanting to have sex with that person who's not my partner. And there's all these other murky emotions inside there that we don't want to see. And we look at the mirror and because we can see the outside face, we go, everything's fine. But a spirit can't do that. A spirit looks in the mirror and sees their reflection. And what happens then when they see that? Well, because they can see their reflection, they go, wow, I'm a mess. There's a higher likelihood for them to engage a process when they can see they're a mess. Does that make sense? And what's now, the process? 
Oh, you've heard it hundreds of times before, Peter, and I'm not going to describe it again. However, can I say something? The spirits often have just as much self-denial um, as we do here on earth. Last week, I spoke to a group of women spirits who I mentioned earlier, and those women spirits refused to look in the mirror. I, I asked them to look in a mirror. And they just refused, flat out refused. And they actually got angry with me. Why are you making us look in the mirror? We don't have to look in the mirror. We're beautiful, they kept saying. And things like that. They're telling me they're beautiful. And I can feel that. No, definitely not beautiful. right? So, so, so I'm asking them to look in the mirror, look in the mirror. Eventually, they look in the mirror. They asked me whether it was a trick. That's how much self-denial they had about seeing themselves. And for us on earth, the reality is that's how much self-denial we have about seeing ourselves. And unless we can begin to see ourselves truthfully, that most of the time we do not have these emotions with God. And most of the time we have no intention of acting like a child. And instead, we have every intention of holding on to our current set of beliefs. Until we can see the truth of that, we cannot progress. And that's the position that you face. You, you yourself are so attracted to the truth here. There's this deep attraction inside of you to the truth. But there is also, at the same time, what your parents, the same parents that Jen had and same parents your brother had, the parents wanted you to completely not see yourself. So while, it, while there's this huge desire in you for the truth, at the same time, there's this huge desire inside of you not to see yourself. And that's what's causing the difficulties for your own progression. And that is going to attract spirits around you in the same condition who will also feel the same way. Does that make sense? And so the key is to allow yourself to see the truth of yourself no matter how bad it is and to be happy that you can see it rather than feeling like, oh, now I'm a mess, I'm, I might as well go and shoot myself. Allow yourself to see it. When you allow yourself to see the truth of how you really are, rather than how you want to be perceived, then you will make a lot of progress because inside of your own soul is a strong desire for truth that's driving you through all of this, all of that stuff, all of that pressure that your parents put upon your family. Is, you know, the, truth, the desire for truth is still there. You can see the desire for truth is in your sister, and even your brother, to a degree, the desire for truth is still present. Mm -hmm. So obviously the three of you have a strong desire for truth, but at the same time it's difficult because there is a strong desire put into you by your parents as well of not wanting to see yourself as you really are. They want you to be what they want you to be and only see that. Yeah. And this is why it's become even more difficult since the parents have passed mm. for you. And a bit difficult, more difficult for Jen as well since parents have passed because there's still this natural desire in the both of you to want to please your parents and therefore see what they see, which is actually the world's view. Yeah. Thanks very much, OJ. My pleasure, Pete. Okay, so, so can we now... Does everyone have any, any other questions about those four things of the world's view? Because what I'd like to do... How much time have I got? It's 20 to 6. I've got no time at all. So, um, well, we've got to leave something for the third session on this anyway. So, there's, there's going to be another session on this subject of the world's view of love. I, I, there's, probably four, there's probably going to be four sessions about it in the end because it, I feel it's just such an important subject to see the contrast between our view, the world's view, and why there is such a contrast between those two positions. Can I just point out, though, that... Um, we have four or five other really popular world's view of love that we would like to present. But in addition to that, remember I said at the start of this discussion and at the start of the first discussion that the world, uh, world thinks it knows what love is. Now, we're already saying that, yeah, it thinks it knows what love is, but not really, hey? 
doesn't really know what love is. The world thinks it knows what love does. Now, we haven't yet finished discovering, discussing the first subject of what love is, let alone yet talking about knowing what love does. And then the third subject we have yet to even cover knows what love feels like. Feels like. So what we would like to do in our future discussions of these subjects is to discuss this more, what love is, and give you some more pointers of comparison where you can compare the difference between what love is from the world's perspective and compare that with what love is from God's perspective. And we want to do the same with what love does and we want to do what same with what love feels like in our presentation about the world's definition of love. Now, hopefully after we've done that, you will have a much stronger conception within yourself, even if it's an intellectual one, of the difference between the world's view and God's view. And we will also, through the discussion, discover a lot of the reasons why the world's view is very different to God's view as well. Does that make sense to everyone? So that's what we'll do over the coming uh, weeks when we do some more presentations. The next one from this weekend will be two weekends time in Bracken Ridge in Brisbane um, in the hall that's there and um, we haven't made any others after that so uh, we're still in planning phase about that. We're leaving our life pretty open because uh, that's the way we like it. Um, tomorrow, um, I think you'll find tomorrow the subject very interesting. It's about the world's view of God rather than the world's view of love. And what I'm going to do tomorrow is discuss... Uh, Sunday's a good day for it. I thought I'd get out the Bible <laughs> and discuss some of the sources of the world's view of God and how they are obviously contradictory in nature. Because it's very important that many of us allow ourselves to connect to God more. At the moment, for many of us, there's still sort of this feeling that God's a long way away out there somewhere and that I can't feel God, right? That I can't feel that God's right next to me. And there is a good reason for that. And that is because of what the world views God to be. That we have all grown up in an environment of and what I'd like to do is discuss that with you tomorrow now we've decided to start the session in the morning at 10 if that's okay with everyone because um, we thought that the people who have traveled would then if we finish about 3 3 30 or something like that then the people who have traveled have a bit more time to get home and have a comfortable meal on the way home or whatever rather than um, having to leave at six o'clock at night and being home at Many of you probably get home at 10-ish or something like that if you've travelled. So um, we've tried to make it earlier on the second day for, you for that reason. Tomorrow we'll also talk about some of our plans with you uh, as well. We've, we want to take an opportunity to do that tomorrow rather than today. Okay. So how do you feel about today? Yeah? Was it good for you to feel about love? <laughs> like... That's good. This subject of love, as you would probably guess, is Mary and I's favourite subject. So our soul's favourite subject is this subject of love, and a close second is the subject of truth. Very close second, actually. So um, those two subjects are subjects that are really dear to our heart, and there's a lot of things that need to be presented about love um, to the world. Now... Can I just say something to you though? For each of us we need to remember one thing and that is this. You can talk to your blue in the face about love but unless you are being love no one is going to believe you. And that's really something that I'd like to leave you with to ponder about. Unless 
we actually be love and the only way we can be love is getting rid of the things that stop us from being love that are inside of us emotionally unless we're actually being love there is actually no proof of the love itself you see we can speak of it over and over but unless there is proof of it changing your life and actually you becoming more loving inside of yourself others cannot be attracted now if you look around at the group here that is here in our current location for the last year around about it has not grown do you notice that there's been a couple new faces here and there but for this group in this region it has not grown why do you think that is because we're yet to be love enough where we're, that it will attract other people to the truth. That's the reason why it's not growing. And so that then puts a responsibility on us, doesn't it? Of going, okay, why aren't I being loved? What addictions am I still in? What addictions am I practicing still that cause me to not accept God's view of love? Because when you do accept God's view of love and you also make the changes inside of your soul that release the negative things inside of your soul and you actually become loving as a result people around you will automatically be attracted to it they won't be able to help themselves because ev because everyone is attracted to love pretty much right and and this is something that we need to bear in mind in our own progression without ourselves changing and actually becoming love the next group of people cannot be assisted because the reality is one person can only usually assist a few hundred people at the most right so unless there are more people in a state of love who can help others this is the how large it will be in this area until more of us get into a place where we are able to assist others through not our words and many of us say the words don't we but it's through the feelings coming from us that that's the thing that everyone will be attracted to yeah so if we can just bear that in mind I'm not saying that to you to hurry up and do anything I'm just suggesting to you that growth can only occur when the helpers are ready now many of you I believe are going to be helpers but we need to get ready to provide that help and assistance and to get ready that means we ourselves need to be in enough of a condition of love where, not, where we're not misleading groups of people but rather helping them to get towards God and towards love ourselves yeah. you want to say babe? I just wanted to add that um, AJ said earlier a couple of months ago I moved out of our place and that was a really hard um, decision really it was a mutual decision and uh, um, but I had a lot of feelings about failing and a lot of feelings uh, of fear about what this means for us um, and a bit of fear about people's expectations of us <laughs> um, but what I said to him at the time was babe you've you've brought me to water so many times but you can't make me drink um you know i need to step up and really live this and break through this big wall of terror that is ruling my life and um i just i just wanted to say that i see him bring us all to water <laughs> all the time but he can't make us drink um and I suppose what I wanted to share with you is that the drinking is the best bit. <laughs> the listening, the li as I said earlier, the listening to these beautiful words that resonate so strongly with us, it's, it feels magical while we're sitting here and we go, yes, this is the truth. But even more powerful is uh, the passion that I have for the path now that I've really started to drink. Mm -hmm. and, and like you were saying to someone earlier today, uh, Justin, I think it was, it feels really uh, off balance, out of kilter, everything's upside down. Um, and, and it's good. 
and it's really good. <laughs> it's really good because you feel your soul growing in that place. And honestly, the closeness that I feel we have now is just, yeah, we were interfacing with my fear before. <laughs> now there is this soul, more of a soul connection. So I just wanted to inspire you a little bit maybe in that direction because mm. it feels so worthwhile to me. So, yeah. 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 Before, uh, with with myself and Mary, it was feeling like I was trying. I know this sounds really bad, probably, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> I was I was imagining. Have any of you seen Naked Gun? I think it's number two or three, where they're trying to have sex with the big condoms that are over their entire body. Well, <laughs> what it felt like was that I just felt like Mary was sort of covered in this rubber sheath, if you like. <laughs> Could no one please imagine that? <laughs> Sorry. And I, I'm trying to touch her heart, but the fear was like the sheath, you know, like the fear is like the block to, to actually touching the heart. And when we talked about it together, about spending this time apart to actually help addressing some of my addictions too, like my addiction to make Mary feel comfortable and so forth had to be addressed as well. And and Mary's terror had, had to be addressed in the sense that she needed to allow herself to get into it without expecting someone to come along and rescue her from it. And and now it feels a lot better like I'm not sort of touching Mary through something. And this is what fear does to us a lot. It, you know, it causes us to put this wall around all of us um, so that when somebody comes to actually have some kind of interaction with us, it's like that sort of touching us through a wall and very, very difficult. It's, it's, if you can imagine it in terms of satisfaction, it's like if you can imagine when a mother has her baby and they put the child in a human crib and you know how they put the child in and you've got to go in through these gloves and you can only touch the child through gloves and all that kind of stuff. And the, the dissatisfaction in the mother is quite palpable, right? In terms of there's no... You know, there's no embracing, there's no loving, there's no, you know, that's what it feels like. You feel frustrated in your love, right? And this is what fear does to relationships. It frustrates the relationship so much that nothing can build and grow. And that's, um, I feel, you know, this is why we address this issue with fear about the world's view of love today. Because, because if you don't address that, at the end of the day, you're left with this fear and terror as being the primary dominant motivating factor in your relationship and particularly in your relationship with God. And that's really not going to work at the end of the day and it's certainly not going to work with our relationship with each other either. Yeah. Yep. All right, well, we'd like to thank you for your patience and understanding today. And oh, we'd like to thank you too for your donations. Uh, feel free to take some of the DVD packs if you haven't had them before. And um, we'd also like to thank those of you who have been donating um, without us doing seminars because we've managed to live on some of those donations. But we've also managed to do quite a lot of other things, actually. Um, there are also different plans that, and changes that we're making to the God's Way of Love organisation that we want to discuss with you as a group um, sometime in the next month. It will be probably a month from now. Um, we're going to change the constitution so that God's way of love does not receive land um, and we want to discuss with you why that's the case and what we're going to do uh, and not so much does not receive land it, it will only receive land under certain circumstances and those circumstances will be quite rare I think you'll be really excited about the changes they're yeah, great yeah they're really nice changes um, and many of you will actually find wanting to be even more involved from the changes, I feel. So we'll talk about, we'll talk about that. Um, but that'll be a separate session on its own. So, so we have tomorrow's session, we have one in two weeks' time, and then one two weeks around about, probably two weeks after that, we'll have this discussion about the God's Way of Love organisation, the changes. I'll read out some changes from the constitution that we've made. And, uh, and the result of that is we don't need to have and we have actually stopped the request with the taxation office to have a non-profit organisation. So, um, so we'll explain what's going on there as well. Yeah, with, with everyone. Anyway, there's a lot afoot. Um, 
Uh, but we can't discuss all of it with you. You'll have to just experience it along with us at some point. Like a child. <laughs> like a child. <laughs> um, tomorrow, though, we look forward to seeing you at 10 in the morning and uh, for those of you who can come. Love you.